it. If it's the first time you're passing through, you're welcome to see if you like it. And if you do, you can put the thumbs up or you can put the thumbs down. You can mingle with my subscribers and um, new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing and existing subscribers. Thank you for hanging in there. I do try to be a bit diverse. And so um, today I'm going to talk about the roundup of it's not really a roundup of news, but I, th I think it is. But I just give my opinion on different topics that have been happening over the day or maybe over the last 24 hours. So what have we got? We've got 4,000 prisoners set free due to coronavirus. Um, I can't imagine why they would set free 4,000 um, criminals. Well, you have to call them criminals because they're in jail. And what's happened is, is that they're due to be released, I think, over the next few months. So, in fact, they're releasing them early. But they're saying they're releasing them in order to take the stress off of the prison staff. But isn't it more dangerous? I mean, since they've had um, an outbreak, I think, well, I don't know which prison it was, but I heard a couple of people died in prison. And I would think that either it's the um, prison staff that have brought it in because it can't be the prisoners because they're locked away, or it is the visiting um their visitors, which I would assume has stopped now. So wouldn't it be safer for our country for them to stay behind bars rather than have them in the community? And if any of them did have it, or I'm assuming they don't, but isn't it more people to take care of? I mean, why, you know, you've got 4,000 people that you're letting loose on the street, not sure where they're going. Not sure if they have anywhere to go to. Not sure how long, how much time they've had. So how does it help anybody by releasing them into the streets? I just don't get it. Um, I, I, I'm lost for words. Um, what did I say? What could possibly be the rationale behind such a myopic move other than a reason to place them under emergency order legislation. That's the only thing I can think of. Because while they're in the prison, they need to be taken care of. And they're taking up resources. You have to feed them. You have to do. You have to treat them in a certain way, because that's the law. But if they do have these um, designated detention camps around the country, I'm not sure if they do exist. But if they do. I guess under the new emergency law, they could actually recapture these people, put them in these detention centres, and they wouldn't have such a responsibility for them. If they want to infect themselves, they can. I doubt very much if they've got somebody who has to go in there and tell them to get up and make sure what they're doing and get in close proximity um, among them if they start fighting. I guess they'd be more or less left to their own devices. That's the only rationale I can think of. I can't think of any other reason why, because they're all being let out early. So it's not like they're being let out free. They're being let out, I, I think, maybe three months earlier than they would have done, but they're all going to be tagged. So they're all traceable. They're all trackable. So it's not like they'll be walking up and down and the police can't track them they can. So I just think it's a bit disturbing um, knowing that we have um, a coronavirus and pandemic going on. You're going to, you, you can't cope with the, the people that you have already. You haven't got enough beds, maybe, for the people you have already, and yet you're releasing 4,000 prisoners who are technically housed and out of the way. So that was the first bit. I had to comment on. Um, apparently 500 of them are either pregnant or elderly. So, um, and it's a temporarily release from jail on license. So I don't understand the logic. If you're temporarily releasing them, what is the point? Does that mean somehow you're going to magic up more staff? I don't understand that at all. So what else is there? So it's the 3,500 
who are within two months of the end of their sentence. They will be temporarily released from jail on license and will be fitted with GPS tags from, from this week. And then you've got 500 prisoners who are pregnant or old and vulnerable who will also be allowed out. I don't even know why women would allow themselves to get pregnant in jail. It's probably through conjugal rights, I would imagine, because I can't think of how else, not unless they were pregnant before they went into prison. I don't know, but it's not a, it's not a good time to be pregnant and it's not a good time to be out of prison. I would have thought, I would have thought from the prisoner's point of view, they're safer in prison than they are outside prison. Anyway, um... Uh, Boris Johnson signed off the move last week after being warned that the coronavirus outbreak in prison could make it impossible for prison staff to cope. But I don't know. I would have thought that it has to be the prison staff or the visitors bringing it in. I mean, this has been going on since the 4th of March. I would imagine that the prisoners wouldn't have visitors every day. I don't know quite how the prison system works. I don't know how often you're allowed to have businesses, but whatever's happened, they brought coronavirus in the jails and the police, the prison staff are petrified, of course. It's like the NHS staff. The irony is, though, uh, well, I guess with the NHS staff, they have to go in. It's not like they can turf those people out on the street, can they? because um, it's a dangerous situation. They have, to risk, they have to risk their lives. I guess the police don't have to risk their lives in the same way. Okay, so that's the first bit. Uh, the second bit is um, non-coronavirus patients are being neglected um, while staff tackle COVID-19. Well, patients feel neglected because what's happening is this priority is being given to COVID-19 patients. Um, appointments are being cancelled. Um, people are afraid to go to the emergency ward just in case. And so a lot of people who would ordinarily be treated cannot be treated because the priority is at the moment um, dealing with coronavirus patients. So um, unintended consequences, non-COVID-19 health Applications. So, yeah, those people who would normally go in maybe for a hip operation or a knee operation or something to do with what I can't think of what they might have, but they would have been going in for an appointment, even cancer patients. I don't know. I doubt very much if they would defer cancer patients treatment in favour of COVID-19. I doubt that. But um, I guess they do feel neglected the patients because you know all the all the appointments the majority of them have been cancelled until further notice lenders are refusing to lend to anybody you know like if you wanted to buy a house now lenders are refusing to lend any money to anyone with less than 40% deposit 40% so they're going to cough up 60%, but they might as well say um, they're not really loaning any money then because when you think about at one point they were giving you a 99% mortgage and now it's 40%. I mean, the only people who are really able to buy and sell at the moment are those who are being forced to sell because they haven't got a choice and cash buyers. So if you've got, there's probably a lot of cash buyers now out there just waiting for the opportunity for the house prices to go down so they can jump on it. But yeah, the property market has effectively frozen while all of this is going on. Um, Zoopla um, is saying that the number of houses sold over the next three months will fall by about 60%. Lockdown has reduce the bank's capacity to process loans. Surveyors are unable to survey properties that easy because they can't go in because of self-isolation and goodness knows what else. Estate agents, they can't show around people to people's houses. I guess if the house is empty, they should be able to. But I don't know how many houses are empty, but technically if the houses are empty, they should still be able to show them around. So that shouldn't stop them from showing them empty homes. Um, difficult to value 
a property in this climate because you don't know whether the prices are going up or down. And the only deals that are going through are those being forced to sell and cash buyers. Now, have you heard about people? I think it's in Birmingham. Um, burning down these 5G towers because of, you know, there's been a lot of hype going around about um, they're causing the symptoms of the coronavirus. Apparently, people have been committing arson and burning down the towers. I think it's in Birmingham. So the telephone companies are really, really pleading, don't do it, because they need the network, especially while people are um, at home they need the, the network to be able to connect people. And the thing is, what they're saying is that it's a ridiculous assumption that the 5G has got something to do with the coronavirus or exhibits the same symptoms of the coronavirus. But, you know, people have got away with having their um, conspiracy theories or having their opinion about what's going on. And when you hear... Um, people who are quite high up and who sound so knowledgeable and they seem to have scientific evidence and all that. A lot of the lay people, they're more likely to believe it because when you, depending on how somebody puts forward an argument, you, you, some, it's, it can, it's believable. A lot of the times, even if it's fake news, sometimes with fake news, if they have the, the you know, a professional type of um, platform and you see the news name at the bottom and it looks kind of authentic, no matter what they say, people believe it. They don't stop to think, well, is it a fake news website? And that is what happens when people um, look at some of these websites or listen to these social influences or listen to people who say they're doctors and scientists and claim um, a certain thing is true, these people don't go around and start um, Googling it and researching. But there again, there are so many sources that say it's got something to do with it. So I guess even if you were to search and look for something that refutes it, it'd be very difficult. So you've got people who are absolutely um, paranoid that the building of the 5G towers are the cause of why so many people are dying. And so um, that's what they're doing. They're rebelling, and it's not the right answer. The right answer really is to keep yourself safe and to keep your family safe because and keep away from it. I mean, if you think it's the towers, just keep away from it. It's no point burning it down. It's criminal. It's criminal damage. You're damaging government property and you know there's cameras everywhere and you know if that's your fear how do you know they're not going to place you somewhere where they've got them all over the bloody place so just think I know I know a lot of people are desperate at this time they're not behaving rationally because everything is going wrong in their lives so they have really kind of rebellious thoughts and they don't know what to do. They don't know. I don't think a lot of people know quite what to do. A lot of people feel totally helpless. And so, you know, when it comes to certain things that are affecting their family and their health, they're not thinking rationally. They're just thinking about survival. And so that is what's happening there. So the telephone companies are pleading, don't burn them down. It's just, it's just not the correct thing to do. So how do you cope when there's no goodbye? That is what many of us are having to face. A colleague of mine, um, she said to me that about three people, three um, relatives of hers have been told they're not going to be given ventilators. So she knows she's not going to see them again, yet you can't go and see them and say your goodbyes. You know that once they go into that ambulance, you probably won't see them again. And you can't go to the hospital and hold their hands and see them through their last moments. I mean, how does that feel? Not only for the person who know they're going to die, but also for the family that are being left behind, who don't get to get that closure, who don't get to say what they want to say during those last few minutes. You know, I was thinking to myself, rather than, you know, let them die from lack of air, 
because if they need ventilators, that means they can't breathe. You know, wouldn't the most um, dignified way of ending their life be to just let them sleep, give them something to let them sleep instead of their last moments be gasping for breath? Because I'm assuming that's why people have the ventilators, to give them air and to help them get through their lungs. So if they know they're going to die, you know, I'd like to think that those people die peacefully and that, the, you know, so that the family who um, cannot go and see them during those last few moments can know that their relatives have died peacefully instead of in a panic gasping for breath. So I don't quite know how it works. I don't know. I can't imagine, though, that you would have staff, not unless they can't see them, gasping for breath and not wanting to do something about it. So maybe it is a bit more humane than that. Maybe it's just like because they're old, they might just have one gasp and, and they're gone. Let's hope so, because I'd like to think that they die peacefully. And, you know, I'm not quite sure how you, um, for those people who have lost someone close to them, how they actually um, get through that closure. So, um, yeah, um, I was watching um, the briefing uh, with Trump changing the, changing the subject um, and, you know, where you have the questions and answers. And one of the questions was, how long before we get back to work? And I was thinking to myself, you know, how long is a piece of string? Because how can you determine when you're going to go back to work if you do not know how long this situation is going to play out? Unless you think it's something that is organised and they can just say, click their buttons and say, OK, we've had enough now. Everybody's going to go back to work. It's not going to work like that. I mean, Trump is saying, oh, it's not going to be long because um, we need to get America up and running. We can't have it closed down. We can't have people. We can't be paying people who are not working. Oh, we're going to get America up and down, up and running. We want to see full stadiums. We want to see all of our public places full of people. We want people in close proximity again. But how? How? I'm not quite sure how that can happen because even in the worst case scenario, it takes three months for the pandemic to run its course. By the end of those three months, the majority of people may not have jobs to go back to. I don't know if, um, especially the small businesses, Okay, the big businesses might be able to run and maybe be able to take people on and on the 80%. But, you know, all of those little small businesses, and they're probably the ones who probably would be um, filling up the football grounds and, you know, rugby and all of that and going to all these events. And they're not going to have money to, to, to fill these um, these big gatherings that, Donald Trump is talking about. So I don't see how um, he can say, oh, you know, we need to get the country up and running when millions are going to die. I don't get it. I don't think it's, I don't think he's quite computed the magnanimous um, impact of this situation. I don't think it's quite computed what exactly is happening here. I think, I think in his mind, I still think he thinks it's like the flu. And I think because he's been told it's more serious, I think he's trying to um, acknowledge that it's more serious. But I think psychologically, I think he thinks it's just going to go away and one day he's going to wake up and everything's going to be back to normal. But depending on how it happens, and the thing is, is, I mean, I was listening to, what's his name, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and he was saying, oh, we're all going to be, we, we, you know, it's going to be back to normal relatively quickly. Relatively quickly by whose standard? What is the standard? Relative to what? 
relative to China, relative to Italy. What is relative? I mean, they were three months. I think China, yeah, just went over three months. I mean, I've heard that there's a resurgence, but I'm not sure. And Italy, basically three months. So does he mean that for America, it's not going to be three months, it's going to be relatively quickly, so it might be two months? I, I, I just don't understand it. I don't think anybody can forecast something like this, how it's going to play out, because it's hitting people who it wasn't supposed to hit. It's hitting the young, young children. And they, they were supposed to have an immunity. And it said that one of the young children who died didn't have no underlying symptoms. So, um, Fauci, um, so somebody asked um, the platform and um, Dr. Fauci responded. Um, originally, Donald Trump gave a 15-day guidance more or less saying, okay, we're all going to be okay after 15 days. Now, he was asking if it's going to be resolved within 30 days, to which Anthony Fauci responded, if we do in a very proactive, if we do in a very proactive way what I said, people across the country as a baseline have physical separation, varying degrees, then we will see the turning of the curve mitigation works. Now what they be my mitigation is that we mitigate the virus by separating from each other physically, wearing your masks, doing the hygiene, but most of all separating yourself from another person. Because the, the virus transmits person to person and it can't it can't transmit if there's no person for it to jump to. And if you're more than six feet away or totally isolated, the virus cannot thrive. So what he's saying is that providing everybody adopts that. But when you have large families and they're all in one household and you've got one going out to work or maybe a couple going out to work and they are coming back in, I don't, I don't think you can say that everybody in that household is going to be six feet apart. Not unless they all go to separate rooms and they're not going to do that. So this is going to take longer than I think they envisage because how can everybody physically separate when they're in families for more than six feet all the time? Because that is what needs to happen for the curve to drop. Or as they say, to see a turn of the curve. Because um, I just don't I just don't see how it can happen any other way. And you'll still have people, you still got people going out, you still got people intermingling, you've still got people going from one area to another. And I heard that Detroit, Louisiana and New York have had the highest cases. <sighs> so, um, so basically, I think we have to ride the storm. And England is very close behind America with, in terms of uh, numbers. So who knows? Um, Donald Trump keeps saying we're not going to destroy our country, that the country is not under his control, not now. It was before the virus. He could control the country, but he can't control it now. It's the virus that will determine whether the country gets back on its feet or whether it falls to its knees. And curtailing, I mean, they're talking about that hydroxychloroquine or whatever it's called. And they want to test that out. But that's not going to be ready for, uh, for a few months. So what happens in the, in the meantime? Uh, and then I wondered, I thought, oh, Detroit, Louisiana and New York. I thought, oh, I wonder what the demographics are in those three 
that are worst hit. So New York, the hardest hit, you've got 17.6 black and 69.7 white out of a population of 8.3 million. In Louisiana, you've got 32.7 black and 62.9% white. But in Detroit, it's 78.6 black and 14.6 white. So it's got nothing to do with the demographics. Why it's going to certain white, you know, some countries are feeling it more than others. Because then I would have said New York, I would have thought New York would have had a higher um, black population, but it doesn't. So I tell you, this coronavirus, it does not discriminate. I have to say that it does not discriminate. It just jumps on whoever is in its range. And that's why regardless of how you think, you know, it's not important to wear a mask. It is. So I prefer to think that Donald Trump is exercising optimism when he says, you know, we're going to get the country up and running. I think he has to be optimistic. I think he has to convince himself. And he said he doesn't like giving bad news. So I think he, he feels as though he needs to give his, his um, people hope. And that is why he's saying we're going to be up and running. America has got to be up and running. It was great before this coronavirus came and it could be great again. But, you know, I wish I had his optimism. Um, so what else is there? I think safe to say that we won't know the impact until it's all over. And how long will it take to be all over? That's anybody's guess. And so that's my little news roundup. I think, I don't think I have anything else. I had, um, oh, no, I'll do a separate one for that. I think I'll do, I might do a part two. I don't want this to go on too long. Okay then, bye-bye.